The future of orthodontics is evolving and changing every day. But although the way to achieve practice growth has changed, there's never been a better time to be an orthodontist. Let's get into the minds of industry leaders, forward-thinking orthodontists, and technology insiders to learn how they see the future of the orthodontic specialty. How will digital orthodontics, artificial intelligence, clear aligner therapy, remote monitoring, in-house printing, and other innovations change the way you practice? Join your hosts, Dr. Leon Klempner and Amy Epstein, each month as they bring you insights, tips, and guest interviews focused on helping you capitalize on the opportunities for practice growth. And now, welcome to the golden age of orthodontics with the co-founders of People and Practice, Dr. Leon Klempner and Amy Epstein. Have you been approached by a DSO or an OSO about selling your practice? We know many of you have been receiving calls and some of you getting some pretty huge offers. Well, there's a lot to think about and to consider, like whether you should sell or not, or when's the best time to sell. And for our residents and recent grads, uh, it begs the question, should you buy into an OSO or maybe pay off some debt first and start your own practice? Let's get some answers on today's episode. Welcome to the golden age of orthodontics. I'm Dr. Leon Klempner, a board certified orthodontist, currently teaching part-time in Harvard, and I am the CEO of People in Practice. And as always, I am Amy Epstein. I have a marketing MBA and 20 years of communications and public relations experience. And we co-founded People in Practice together just about 10 years ago. And nowadays I spend my time implementing strategies that I learned when I was working with large brands and applying them to local practices to help them grow. Today, we're thrilled to have Dr. Scott Law as our guest. He is a co-founder of Smile Doctors, an orthodontist-owned orthodontic group. He is an orthodontist practicing and charged with overseeing the clinical processes and the responsibilities for the organization. His backstory is interesting. After his residency at Jacksonville University School of Orthodontists, he and his wife Jessica bought a small practice from a retiring orthodontist. And using techniques uh, that we're always talking about with regard to customer service and employee empowerment, focusing on fun and excellence, they grew that location to one of the largest practices in the United States. So together with his partners, uh, Scott has grown Smile Doctors to over 360 ortho pra partner practices. So we're really happy to have you here, Scott. Thank you for joining us today. Oh, it's an honor to be on. Thank you for, uh, thank you for having me today. So Scott, uh, you and I know each other for quite a number of years. Uh, I've crossed paths many times and I see you've been busy and 360 ortho practices, um, that's quite an accomplishment. And I, I have to say that um, from knowing Scott as many years as I do know him, um, whether he was in his own practice or as part of this large group, he's always put the patient first. And I've always admired that. It's always been my philosophy and our philosophy here at People in Practice as well. So. Uh, I'm, I'm particularly happy to have you on the podcast. And my first question is uh, a major one, which is what are the primary advantages of joining Smile Doctors? And maybe you could talk about it from the perspective of somebody either selling or partnering with you, or maybe a young graduate deciding to uh, take it as their first job. Absolutely. No, I think, Leon, I think our paths crossed years ago in a study club right when I got out of residency and I was um, looking for answers and looking to see how could I grow? What would my career look like going forward? I always admired you, your candor, your mustache. It was uh, so just uh, appreciate that. Um, yours is, yours I, is pretty good, too, I have to hey, say. I mean, you know, I, hey, 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 hey. Great. Yeah, so I love my game. Um, no, I think uh, to answer the question, it's one we get all the time from different doctors is when is the right time to join or not join? Am I the right fit or what what's a what's this OSO thing all about? Um, and I'll yeah, I'd love to love to answer from the perspective of, of selling docs and 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 
and docs coming out of residency. So um, what we look for as an organization is the same thing that any doctor looking to partner with other doctors is looking for. We want, we want people who are, who are hard workers, who love to, uh, love to collaborate on solutions and love to look forward to see where, where are, how, how can we get together to, to join strengths and to identify where our weaknesses are and to bring in others where, where we have those gaps. And I think that's, that's the true essence of what an OSO should be. And the successful ones do that very well, is to identify, you know, what are some opportunities in a changing landscape, especially now, um, as we're looking, you know, we're looking forward to what's, what's coming, the storms that are upon us, and trying to identify how can we navigate these waters and, and what can we do? I think uh, there's a lot of questions that, that doctors have of, you know, what, what's the economy gonna hold? Um, what, how are patients going to want to pay, want to start, want to, what, what does all of this look like, all of these unknowns? And navigating this together with, with orthodontists who, who put their brains together to come up with solutions is, is the best way. I know that early on in my career, it's why I sought out all these study clubs was, um, I didn't have answers. I didn't know where to turn. And, and many times on, I, I would get some answers. I think they were a little bit embellished from, uh, to say the least on, on some of these study groups. It's pretty cool to have partners who shoot you straight and who, who tell it like it is and share their perspective. And then we can take the kind of the, the best practices of the best practices and put those together to, to benefit the whole. So I think um, as residents coming out of school with a ton of debt, not knowing um, if they want to uh, be great at everything you need to be great at in order to compete in today's marketplace from understanding HR, understanding uh, negotiations on cost of goods, um, buildings, real estate, uh, all the customer service stuff, um, the ortho is the easy part. And so having the benefit of huge, uh, you know, legal department, HR marketing operations is is a huge advantage so that the doctor can be the doctor and can can treat the patients and put them first instead of sometimes sometimes a patient gets put last because of all the other things that that it takes to have a successful practice. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, if we're in the spirit of straight shooting, are sure. there downsides uh, or risks of joining um, an OSO or joining Smile Doctors in particular? Yeah, I think I think there are. I think uh, I think you need to listen to many advisors. You need to you need to talk to people who are in it, and you need to to know like, is this a fit for me? It it it. One must always understand that when you ask someone, hey, is this right for me? If somebody who's in it is going to likely say yes. Someone who's not, especially uh, some, some financial advisors who, um, who are incented to not have you leave their services, they're probably gonna tell you no. And so there's, there's different things. I, of course, am going to tell you yes because of, um, because of our track record, what we've done and the people that we have and the partners that we have and, and, uh, and the successful exits that we've, that we've sustained, as well as the trajectory that we're on. I know that we're only on 360 locations and we're just beginning to scratch the surface of what's possible in serving the patient in the best way. Um, in not only clinically, but customer service, using technology, artificial intelligence, um, every single thing that we can do. We just have, we have all channels of our organization are doctor led. And, um, and within those, we have committees of doctors who add to that, who, who really push it along. But I would say, you know, the downsides would be if you're not a fit for that organization, I would definitely ask questions. Um, there are doctors out there who want full 100% control of everything that they do all the way around. And I would say if that's you, then an OSO is not for you. It, what it takes is, is the spirit of partnership, knowing that practice is ever evolving. It's always got to get better and better and we're never gonna land at the perfect practice. And so for someone who, who wants total control of 
every facet of practice, every facet of the business, um, controlling all of their team, all of their, you know, all their patients, all their treatment, all their every single detail. It doesn't work out. And uh, we try, we really try and fish that out ahead of time to identify and say, hey, this isn't a fit. This is, you'd be better, best not to, not to partner at all. Uh, even though the money might make sense, I think we'd both be miserable in joining together and in, in a partnership. So it's just like any, any partnership, any doctor that you're going to have join your practice, you just want to identify those things ahead of time. Mm-hmm. Um, well, thank you for the candid response, uh, first yeah. of all. Um, so on our podcast, we typically invite listeners to submit their questions, and we have a question for you today. So we're going to go ahead and, and play it for you now. Hi, my name is Dr. John Graham, and I'm from Salt Lake City, Utah. Are there certain criteria that you have found that make an orthodontist a good candidate for an OSO? Yeah. Uh, John, uh, love John. John's a great friend of mine, also a, a straight shooter. So I, I appreciate the, the question. I think um, what I would say is, again, someone who seeks excellence, someone who wants to really take and maximize their license to treat the patient and to, to love them, to take care of them. I love your guys' name. Um, you put people first. It's obvious. And, um, and with us, our, our motto is is we love patients first, we straighten teeth second. And so if that is the way that we can treat, is that that's something that, you know, that we look for in a, in a, in a doctor, it's like, how do they treat their team? How do they, are, do they ask questions about their team through this process of what's gonna happen to them after the partnership? Um, what, what do they have as far as potential in their careers and advancement? And uh, what's their quality of life going to be like? Those are great indicators to know that, hey, this doctor really does care, really wants what's best for, for the patient. And it's not just a transaction and not just something that, hey, I'm going to take this money and then it's going to be, you know, then I'm going to ride off in the sunset. That's not how any DSO or OSO works that I'm familiar with and certainly not one that, that's, that's very successful. I'm, I'm sure you could probably find situations like that where you know someone will buy your practice and then and then you leave um that's not what that's not what smile doctors is about certainly we want partners we want um to use our our doctors knowledge expertise to uh, to make their practice the best it possibly can be and influence all other you know 360 locations um with with ideas and and techniques in order to make us all better um, so that, that's really it. It's that attitude of, do they love people and, uh, are they, are, are they willing to share? Are they willing to contribute and are they willing to learn and check their ego? And we all have an ego, uh, check, check our egos in order to understand how others are doing it so that we can all get better. That's, uh, mm -hmm. that's really our, our focus. So can I ask just a quick follow up? Because uh, yeah. this kind of stuff interests me um, just in general. There was one time when I um, w a while ago when I was applying for a position at, at a PR firm, a global PR firm, and the I went through a lot of, uh, you know, organizational psychology analyses to sort of see if I was a fit. And I wouldn't expect that you would do the exact same thing for this. But are there different, uh, like, how do you figure out if someone's a good fit? How do you enable the doctor to figure out if they're a good fit for you? Like, are there things that you exercises or questions or is it by conversation? Tell, tell me a little bit about that. That's, that's great. I know, I think that's the secret sauce that everybody's looking for is how can you identify it? We have an incredible mm -hmm. business development team that's made up, again, doctor led. And, uh, and we have, we have docs and go and sit down, break bread, talk to them, talk to, to their spouse, understand, you know, what, what is their motivation to even consider doing this? Um, is it purely transactional? Is it one that, that they want to, you know, what's there, there's usually a, something that the doctor is looking for, whether it is camaraderie, partnership, um, working together, understanding there's all these non-monetary benefits that, that come with joining a successful group like Smile Doctors. 
And it's, um, and it, it's really, we want to identify what is that? Can we solve that? Can we help them with, with this? And, and if so, then I think it would be a great thing. Of course, we have to make the money work and the money has to work. It has to make sense for, for all parties involved. But then afterwards, we're partners. And so we want to see, okay, what, how, how can we treat our patients in the best possible way? And, and really, it always comes back to that, Amy, is like, do people care about the patients? And do, do we put them first? Like everything that we do within our organization, we have to ask, okay, but how does this benefit the patient? How does this affect the culture? How does this affect, you know, the, the teams and the doctors? How, and that, that, those are all questions that we ask because I think there's a lot of things that we could do. Certainly, you know, you come across and it might make bit, perfect business sense, you know, on math and, and it, the pro forma all adds up. But if it doesn't make sense for the people, then it doesn't make sense at all and it will not work. And so while I wish there was a test that we could take and there are there's expensive ones you can you can take, you know, and get profiled on and everything there. Uh, it's really just sitting down heart to heart and going, you know, is this is this uh, is this a fit? And I think throughout the course of, of Smile Doctors over the last seven, eight years, we've had a, a tremendous track record of identifying that our, our partners. Um, when they when they join, yes, they get a they get a great financial payout, and uh, and then they take ownership. They're partners in in the overall entity of Smile Doctors, and so as Smile Doctors transacts in the private equity you know realms, then then they see the financial benefit of that. But it's also if if it were just a one and done and a five year commitment and that was it, I got my money and I'm gonna run, then they wouldn't re re up and re you know re-sign with, with our contracts and we have we have just a tremendous record of our doctors wanting con to continue to stay involved and uh and signing employment contracts again and again because of the environment because of how they're treated because of how they're contributing so all of these um non-monetary right i'd say non-transactional -trans reasons of doing it or is, is why it works and so um, yeah, it's a big benefit that way. So Scott, you brought up money a couple of times. Let's let's sure. go right there. I'll put you a Great. little bit on the hot seat if you don't mind. Um, so for our uh, recent graduates and for our residents, there is a metric used in determining the value of your practice called EBITDA, uh, E-B-I-D-T-A, earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, amortization. Uh, it's used to uh, evaluate a practice and determine um, the payout, and it's usually a multiple. And I've heard multiples of four times, I've heard multiples of 12 times, it's all over the map. Uh, you mentioned, quote unquote, big payout. Give me an idea of exactly how it works. What do you, you know, what, how much do you get if you sell the practice, um, as well as um, how is it paid out? Yeah, great question. I think uh, the structures are different for you know, it's all timing. Everything is in, in business. I think uh, somebody told me, you know, I, I chose an amazing location for my first practice right out of school. And it was all timing. Had I graduated six months earlier, or six months later, I, I wouldn't have had that opportunity. And so I think it's what the market bears certainly is what the what the multiple is, what the average multiple is. And then it's also based on size of practice and profitability of that practice. So if the practice is a solo location and it's your average size practice, then it will likely get an average size multiple. And that varies, you know, at this time, it's, uh, you know, it, it, again, it's all based on, it's, it's hard to say because it's all based on profitability, but anywhere, like, like you said, from the four to the six times range, I don't, I don't quite know. It's all, it's all based on what that size is, but as you get to be a bigger practice and let's say multiple locations, you have infrastructure in place, there's multiple associates and it's, and it's more of an operation like that. Again, based on profitability, then you would expect that the that the EBITDA multiple is higher, and then from that, um, from there, there's always uh, different groups do different things. Um, we we offer a cash payout, and then we offer also offer you know if doctors want um, want a portion of that to go into equity and in ownership of the Smile Doctors LLC. 
And, uh, and, and of course, that's what uh, we would want is that all doctors, all uh, shareholders are aligned towards, uh, towards success. And so as we all benefit, as all of our practices grow, then we all see a financial, you know, financial payout again and again. And it's that second, that third, that fourth bite of the apple that, um, that truly creates generational wealth in that way. And that's, that's what is a, it's a big benefit. I know we've talked a lot about money. Um, again, that has, I can't reiterate enough that has to make sense, but that's not the primary reason for doing this, nor was it the primary reason of, of why we started it years ago. I think, um, years ago, smile doctors was began by, um, by Dana Fender, Greg Goggins and myself. And we just had this idea that we wanted to control our destiny within the orthodontic industry instead of have it be put upon or have us be a part of a dental DSO where orthodontists were kind of subject to, to the dentists and, uh, and just treated as such. We, we kind of, we were able to prove that, Hey, you know, we can go direct to patient market, direct to patients, just as, as people in practice does and, uh, and go right to the consumer and, and really, um, not be so dependent on, on the general dentist referrals, um, as, as it was in years past or, or the pediatric dentist referrals. And so as they were giving out multiple, um, you know, multiple orthodontist names at consult, then, uh, we, we all as an industry kind of, kind of shifted and, and we, we've proven that that's the case. But I think as other OSOs have, have come on, I don't know exactly their reason for for founding, if if it was um, the same the same purpose, or if they or if there were dollar signs that they that they saw that they wanted to go after, um, but certainly it is, in, and we all know that orthodontic practice is very profitable when done correctly, and uh, and and that's great. But I also think there are so many other things that when you can offload all the all the stuff that doctors don't enjoy doing all of the HR, the operations, the, you know, some of the legal, some of the, all the stuff that a doctor doesn't like to do. That's what we like to take off their plate. And we okay. like to have the doctor focus on what they love. So Scott, just to be clear, um, uh, a seller could take the entire payout without any rollover equity, or they have, or they can have that option. Is that pretty much yeah. right? And do they get paid up front? Yes, they do. Yeah. So they can have that option. Um, it's again, I think that's uh, that's an instance where we would love to have it be much more aligned where they do take a portion in equity mm -hmm. um, because then we're all aligned and there's reason for them to perform and, and be a great partner as as we I kind of in some of these deals, I represent all of our other partners. And so as we bring on some, we want to make sure that 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 every other partner would be pleased with with um, with who's joining our group and their alignment okay. with it and the future success of it. But it's not required, correct? It's not required. It's okay. not required. And and just as a follow up for the younger grads, uh, you know, I'm over at Harvard and, you know, residents coming out now, they, they owe a lot of money and they need money and they need a job, which is is, is great for somebody like you that are looking for for people to come in. So as a young graduate, if I were to uh, work for Smile Doctors, let's say, could you give me an idea of how much money I would make? Um, yeah, again, it kind of varies on, in the market, um, different different areas that are tougher to, you know, to, to find a doctor in, they'll pay a little bit more as um, in order to, to attract someone to that area. So more remote areas might pay a little bit more. Um, the, the salaries range, it's, it's the going rate out there, anywhere from, you know, 300 to 350 and up and up based on based on location. But uh, I would just say that's a that's a good a good general starting point. And then I would also add to that we want doctors to stay with us. We we're, we're, we want the consistency in treatment and uh, the continuity of care all the way through. It's great for marketing. It's great for the patient. It's great for all the other benefits. And it's just great. It's great for the team and, and all the other partners. So for that, we offer our, our residents the ability to um, purchase equity or to grant them equity. And so there, there's, there's um, things that we want we want to incentivize all of our doctors to be successful, to, to pull in the same direction on the rope so that we can, 
we can we can all benefit by our our labors, our work, and and the outcomes that those achieve. Mm-hmm. Um, so let me ask you about. So we we often hear about. Um, doctors who are approached about selling their practice. Um, Is there any reason they would need to um, talk to you now? Uh, What basically what I'm asking is, is the urgency to sell a practice to an OSO real? Like is the urgency that we're, we're often asked about, like we have to do this right now or poof, it all goes away. Like talk to us a little bit about if that's real. Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, I think that there, as money has changed and 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 the focus is on on different investments. I know that dental and orthodontics is one that that's great. It it is one where um, orthodontists and private equity uh, firms can can do very well to raise the bar for how patients are treated, how care is delivered for for patients. Um, I think that the sense of urgency is one that, you know, practices are valued based on their production. And it's usually an average over the last several years. So as, as production is high, people get, people get a higher multiple for what that is. Um, I would also say that, yeah, it, it really depends on the questions that, that the doctor has um, for how, how much of their life are they, are they redlining in in business where everything is is an emergency everything's going on and they need they need additional help and to bring somebody on so they've grown it as far as they possibly can and then from there what can they do beyond where do they need help and so there there's that sense of urgency and and then um i think it's i think it 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 really comes down to you know what like i said like those questions that they want to answer for themselves um I, I know that as practices grow or as, as Smile Doctors grows, our equity price, our, our share price goes up in value. And so with that, I think that, that would be it, is, is how early would you want to get on so that your, your share value is, is worth more over time. So as it grows over time, um, you, you, get, uh, you get a higher payout at the end of the day. So that's a big one. Um, but um, that that's, that's that's how I'd answer that question, Amy. I I don't know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, no, that's so helpful. I mean, it's partly looking at, at share value on the on the OSO sure. side, but then on the personal urgency side, we sometimes have urgency that we not create, but that that's uh, things that we need to deal with now that may create more or less of a focus on making a deal on the sooner side. Sure. Go ahead, Dad. Yeah, I was going to say that it. it you know, most of the doctors I speak to that are considering selling, and we represent, a, a, you know, a number of practices that do want to do that and hire us to get their numbers up so that, you know, their valuation and, and you know, they have more of a, uh, a sellable uh, practice, so to say. But, you know, it seems like most of the, the orthos that are uh, in this market to sell for a number of different reasons are on the more mature side, closer to retirement. Um, and it, it seems that selling at a younger age, when you put it down on a, on Excel sheet, um, it seems like even with the large payout that, that you're offering that in the long run, it, it, from a financial standpoint, seems to still make sense to own the practice. Um, and have uh, you know full equity in it. So I, I'm curious as to your thoughts on that, as well as the last question I have. And I know we're running out of time, but I, you know I, I have so many different questions because it's such a hot topic, and, and we're approached all the time about it. Um, is that you know as as orthos that are selling retire? These are the more mature. Uh, orthodontists with experience that are helping to to keep the practices on uh, you know on a on a positive yield so to speak um are you troubled at all by you know having losing all of that experience and having either enough young doctors to carry on or enough experience that could maintain the growth 
I know it's a complex thing and I'm, you know, I'm all over the map <laughs> on it, but I'm just interested in, in your thoughts about it. Cause these are things I think about. Absolutely. No, these are, these are questions kind of when we started the, when we founded it years ago, we thought that the, we thought that the model really was going to be retiring orthodontists would want to join. And I have been so pleasantly surprised to see that the partners that, that we're getting are actually um, right, right in the prime of their careers. And so many are, are mid forties, early fifties. And so have a ton of runway in their career left uh, in order to, you know, in order to practice, grow the practice and be financially successful. And it's it's docs who truly want to partner, who want to advance the industry and who also, again, say the, the money has to make sense over the long term and over over multiple private equity events that 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 money makes incredible sense. And the time value of money is something that that we can't discount. I think my my answer to you, Leon, would be, you know, who makes that Excel sheet? Um, is it is it a financial advisor who who would be affected if if you were to sell your practice and uh, and and you were to no longer use their services? I think that that you know that that Excel sheet can be manipulated. Um, it's it's also one where you have to look and see you know what's the track record of the OSO. How have they done over time, and what is what do the financial markets look ahead, both in the private sector, um, you know, independent orthodontists as well as in the you know in the with with private equity and, and potentially one day you know in the in the public markets, and so as you look and evaluate all these things, you really have to decide what what makes the most sense. What are those questions that you want to answer for yourself about practice and, and going forward, and what is the the competitive market hold for for you and what what your life's all about i think one of the big things is doctors who join us they have a ton going on at home and their kids are in you know in their their early or teen years and the docs want to be home for that and they want to be a part of that so having partners having uh, support services that can support them and they can offload all of those responsibilities and they can be at home present with their families uh, loving what they do, you know, at work, but then also loving what they do at home as as parents and and spouses. So that's a, that's a big one. Okay. Um, your second question was um, I, I forgot the the second one. What the well, uh, yeah, retiring okay. the experienced doctors versus the younger doctors yeah. coming in the balance there. Yeah, yeah, the transition there. That's a big thing for us. That's a huge thing for us. So. If, if we have a doctor who's looking to retire immediately and wanting wanting to transition out, um, we, we want them to be very up, up front about that. But like you said, so much of marketing, so much of that, that institutional knowledge of that doctor, that area, all that they have done, all the relationships that they've built, we want a very successful transition for that. And so we're looking for the best and the brightest partners. We're looking for the best and the brightest um, residents who want to come out, who want to partner with us long term, or we can build a practice around them. And, uh, and I think we have some very attractive models that way, both in a, from a joint venture perspective, a de novo perspective where they have ownership and then they can sell back to Smile Doctors on uh, their portion. So there is a lot of attractive um, vehicles for them where, where they can be successful and uh, from a financial standpoint, as well as from a career and lifestyle at home standpoint. Well, this has been really good information. Thank you, Scott, for joining us today. We appreciate you being here. Um, and we would love to have you back if you're open to it. Love to do it. Love to do it. That's great. great. So if our listeners would like to learn more about you, learn more about Smile Doctors, how do they get more information or get in touch? Absolutely. You can contact me directly. My email is scott.law at smiledoctors.com or my cell phone, uh, 512-705. 8118. And um, yeah, love to answer any questions and, and just see uh, many, many cases. I, um, people are looking, Hey, is now the right time? What's the urgency? You, you've kind of mentioned that earlier. It's, uh, you know, we can, we can tell, yes, now is the right time for you. Or we can say, Hey, go work on some of these things and then come back 
and uh, mm-hmm. and and it would be much better for you at a, at a different time. And we have multiple partners who who have done that, and years later come back and go, "Thanks for being shooting me straight, for not taking advantage of me earlier, and paying me a, a small payout, knowing my practice was on such a growth trajectory." And uh, and instead, we just have happy people who love what they do and and love treating patients. Great, That's thanks, great. Scott. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Scott. Take care. Talk Bye. to you soon. This episode is powered by ULab Systems and our newest sponsor, Dental Monitoring. There are, just a note here, there are a lot of remote monitoring strategies, but true AI is a real differentiator. So whether you're offering aligners or braces, DM's remote monitoring makes it possible to reduce the number of office visits, shorten treatment time, and provide streamlined, convenient communication that really does focus on the patient and putting the patient first, like Scott was talking about. And from a marketing perspective, these are really valuable, tangible differentiators that can make practices very attractive to new patients. That Those are marketable things that uh, can bring new patients in. So we're pleased to be working with more closely with both companies. They're both leaders in uh, innovative orthodontic strategies and technologies, and they really do give orthodontists the tools uh, that they need to offer profitable treatment options to patients um, and that better patient experience that I just talked about. So you can subscribe or download other ap- other episodes of the Golden Age of Orthodontics on Apple, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, and now YouTube if you want to look at us while we're talking uh, or wherever get your podcasts. And if you enjoyed it, we'd appreciate you telling a colleague. And for more information about people and practice, you can sign up for our free marketing newsletter on our website at pplpractice.com. Thanks for watching and listening. Um, As you know, the world is going digital and um, it's important to provide a stronger patient experience, streamline office flows, better clinical outcomes, um, and move in a digital direction. So how is your practice doing that? People in Practice offers a suite of digital marketing services, including our latest new patient acquisition subscription solution called Patient Q, which includes reviews, digital forms, HIPAA two-way texting, as well as a new patient dashboard. If you'd like to contact me directly uh, with any marketing questions, shoot me an email at leon at pplpractice.com. And remember, for forward-thinking orthodontists, it's never been a better time to be an orthodontist. We are in the golden age. Take advantage of it. And so long for now. Thank you for tuning in to the golden age of orthodontics. Subscribe now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or visit our website at thegoldenageoforthodontics.com for direct links to both the audio and video versions of this episode.